What's going on guys? I'm Tyler. I'm finally here at TIFF 2022 after six hours of my life that I will never get back. More details on that in a future video, but in order to kick things off, I'm here to let you know that Butcher's Crossing is no perfect movie. And Butcher's Crossing tells the tale of a young man named Will Andrews, played by Fred Heshinger, who in the Old West decides to join a buffalo hunting expedition led by this mysterious man named Miller, played by Nicolas Cage. But for various circumstances, they face harsh weather, their food supply runs low, and tensions start to rise between crew members as they debate whether or not they should have been there in the first place. Now, you say Nicolas Cage in a Western, and I'm instantly there. Dude has played such a versatile amount of character archetypes throughout his career that you could put him in the Old West, whether it be something romanticized and spaghetti Western stylish or something more gritty and realistic in the vein of John Ford or Clint Eastwood, and he could fit in that perfectly. And when I read the synopsis, it became clear to me that this was going to be more of a survival drama that takes place in the Old West, which, you know, has been done a few times before, but not as often as some people give it credit. And I was initially excited that they were going to go for a more gritty and realistic approach, because after seeing his performance in Pig, I want to see Nicolas Cage take more roles like this, where he's an actor first and never really a meme if that makes any sense. And I know for some people that takes the fun out of it, but I mean, there's so much material already that he doesn't need to be the meme anymore. I just want to see him focus on his career again. And I will say this, while it isn't a bad movie by any means, as I was watching Butcher's Crossing, all I could think of was that as decent enough as it was, it could have been so much more. But make no mistake, what definitely works about Butcher's Crossing is the acting. I mean, was Nicolas Cage good in this movie? Of course he was. Dude was pitch perfect in a role that was very similar to Pig, in that his acting style, and this is going to sound weird, is stylish but also understated at the same time. And in order to build up his presence, the direction definitely emphasizes what a mysterious and enigmatic role that he has. In his introduction, you actually hear him speaking off screen but the camera is focused on Will, and then it'll pan over to him on his horse, bald head, a huge amount of buffalo hides that he's wearing, and he looks absolutely intimidating and badass. And when he lights his pipe, and he sees, as he starts to describe the very few details about himself that he will reveal, the camera slowly pans in on him as smoke just shrouds his face, and his acting never overshadows the filmmaking, it never overshadows the side characters, it's nuanced in the perfect way possible. And <clears throat> it suits the character too, because at the very beginning, he gives off this first impression that he's this no-nonsense guy who will only do a job if he has the people and resources right in front of him. It doesn't matter if you are a pain in the ass. It doesn't matter if he, if you, if he hates your guts. If you have the skills needed for the job and you're willing to work, he will hire you no matter what. But over the course of the movie, as the crew get more in over their heads, it becomes incredibly clear that his definition of what needs to be done differs from literally everyone else. And I won't spoil what happens, but his actions over the course of the movie start off on the basic principles of needing to survive in order to get the job done. But then it progresses into this need for supposedly greed or maybe even pride because this is a job that he is notorious for his entire reputation and fortune depends on it but it causes him to slowly go insane and lead the other crew members to become antagonistic towards one another fred heshinger as will was pretty good as your typical naive innocent who, who learns the hard way how to survive in the old west but i'm so used to characters like him slowly turning into the cold-hearted antagonist that he initially never could be or never wanted to be. But in this one, dude gets broken down hard based on just about every difficult task that he has to endure on a regular basis. When he has to skin buffalo hides, he has blood all over him. He's He gets sick all the damn time. He's worried about infection. And it's something that he experiences on a regular basis, on a daily routine, even by the hour. And it breaks him to the point where he becomes so submissive and he can't make a choice of his own at his own free will. And even when he does, he's belittled for taking the initiative, speaking his own mind, that he becomes even more pessimistic and starts to question whether it's even worth it to stand up for himself. 
Jeremy Bob is also likable for how despicable he is. He has this slimy presence through his facial expressions and line delivery, and he also gives off this first impression that slowly changes throughout the movie as this greedy, self-centered bully who roasts everyone in front of him, only supposedly cares about what money can afford in his lifestyle, but as time goes by, you slowly and reluctantly start to side with him, because every fear that he had about the expedition going in slowly turns out to be true, and he's the only person who is consistently willing to stand up to Miller without fear, while still being a complete dickhead to everybody else around him in order to cope with his new situation. All of these actors elevate the material that they're given throughout their performances, but Cage and... Heshinger are really the only characters that have fleshed out or mysterious qualities to them that make them interesting. As good as the other actors are, the side characters are not all that interesting, and they have just about one defining character trait that kind of gets old after a while. Xander Berkeley's big shtick is initially that he is a one-handed man. But honestly, you could have written that out and it wouldn't have changed a thing. Hell, I actually forgot about a half hour later that he only had one hand because you never actually see it up close. His defining trait is that he's the religious fanatic who is God-fearing, tries to drink his sorrows away, hoping that nothing bad will happen to him. And he does get a couple good moments, one involving a uh, plate of beans that had my audience laughing because, long story short, they could not believe that he went there, but... There wasn't really all that much to him. There was this one actress named Rachel Keller who was part of the panel of the Q&A and was introduced at the very beginning. And I mean no disrespect to Rachel Keller, but I have absolutely no idea why you were there. Because while she's not bad by any means, this movie is based on, off of a novel, and you can tell that she had way more to do in the book. Because she's only in this to serve as a love interest to Will for one scene and one scene only. It was a huge missed opportunity, as was Paul Racy from Sound of Metal as this Buffalo High tycoon who is memorable and gives a great performance based off of his over-the-top accent and grouchy demeanor towards everyone around him. But he's barely in the movie to supposedly pose a threat to the Buffalo Hunters. He's supposed to be, he's supposed to have the power of like an oil tycoon or a baron. But you never see him screw anyone over on screen. You never see his other hunters who are supposedly his goons that take all the glory from the other hunters who do the actual work while he reeks in the awards. He's a very obvious anti-capitalist metaphor, but again, he needs to be in the movie a lot more often to serve as a presence. If he had the presence of Eli Wallach in The Magnificent Seven, where supposedly he and his goons were able to steal the buffalo hides off of the main characters, he would serve as a legitimate threat, and it would still fit into the survival aspect of the grittier atmosphere that the story is going for, because they would have a lot more to lose. There would be more at stake. Speaking of the atmosphere and tone, I wasn't really sure what to expect from Gabe Polsky, the director, seeing as how he's mostly made documentaries throughout his career. He co-directed one fictional film about 10 years ago, and I've never seen it, never heard of it, but... I should point this out. At the Q&A, he mentioned that he wasn't the biggest fan of Westerns, how he finds them oversimplified tales of good versus evil with gratuitous violence, and if you've seen more than one Western, you know that that in and of itself is an oversimplification, and a little bit hypocritical because without giving anything away, there's a clear distinction between what is good and what is evil throughout this film, especially if you're going for something that's anti-capitalist. I mean, I can compare this to Daily Wire's Terror on the Prairie. Say what you will about the cast and crew and their politics. I don't agree with all of it. I only signed up to it for the movies. But what I can say is that the direction, cinematography, and editing of Terror on the Prairie had its own style that was reminiscent of Sergio Leone and John Ford's spaghetti westerns, but it still was able to portray the Old West, while still a little bit romanticized in the beautiful landscapes, as being large and majestic, but also cold-hearted and brutal. There are a few great, beautiful landscapes of Montana pretending to be Colorado with the mountains and the countryside, 
the buffalo hunting sequences were definitely the highlight of the film. The sound design, the performances, and the imagery, the way that they handled the real-life buffalo herds, really gave you the sense of how physically and mentally challenging it was to do this kind of work. And Leo Bernberg's musical score was eerie as hell and gave the atmosphere this psychological horror vibe that a survival drama definitely needs. But outside of that, the direction features a lot of very straightforward shot reverse shot techniques that, again, aren't bad, but there's nothing special about them. And there's a lot of handheld camera work that distracts from the images itself. The only thing stylistically that really stands out are these dream sequences that are meant to be surreal and jarring with the way that they jump cut between each horrific image, but that didn't work for me because these dream sequences come out of nowhere with no buildup whatsoever, and the images themselves, with a few exceptions, don't linger on screen long enough for you to actually soak it in and feel all that terrifying. And the worst part is, they don't even really tie into the story, if I'm being completely honest. I was expecting some of these dreams to be supposedly premonitions of what were to come, but none of these images ever come into fruition. I feel bad dissing on this movie because Butcher's Crossing wasn't technically bad, the acting is good, the direction is technically decent, and the messages that they're going for, while being anti-capitalist is pretty simplistic, the movie does make valid points, you could just, you could tell that they needed more time in order to really flesh out the source material, because I've never read John Williams' book, but just skimming through Wikipedia on what they left out, one could say that this would have worked better as a miniseries where you would have taken time to explore every character's background, you could explore the themes of the messages in a more balanced way, because I felt that one leaned more towards the other, but as is... It's perfectly serviceable. If you just want to see Nicolas Cage in a Western alone and giving a great, grounded performance, you're definitely going to get that. And for those reasons alone, I'm going to give Butcher's Crossing a 3 out of 5. Guys, thanks as always for watching. Stay tuned for more TIFF 2022 reviews. And if you were in the audience with me at the grand premiere September 9th, why were you guys on your phone so much? And uh, why did you guys cheer at fucking everything during the opening credits? Or how cool was it to see Nicolas Cage in person? Either way, let me know in the comments below. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.